Welcome to the Creative Life Story Work podcast, where we explore how a creative approach to life story work can help children and young people who've been in care make sense of their past and build a brighter future. A new model for life story work is being rolled out in the northeast of England, and this podcast shares the latest learning and investigates how it could help improve the lives of care experienced children and young people across the country. My name is Dawn Williams and I'm an associate at Blue Cabin, one of the partners on this exciting work in the region. So far in our podcast series, we've thought about what is a story and and who gets to tell that story. What are the ethics of storytelling and what is told and what's not told? Um, Today's podcast is being recorded at our learning event. We've gathered questions during the event for our guests to consider. And so now I'm going to invite um, Pam and Joanne and Richard from uh, Therapeutic Life Story Work International and our two artists, Elena and Michelle, to um, answer some questions. We've got some questions uh, for that are general questions, but the first one, um, that I wanted to ask that has come through from one of our guests today um, is, um, and I'm going to put this to Richard. Um, so Richard, what is unique about involving artists in the creative life story work model? Well, I think the the unique concept is that uh, not only is the work done in a creative way, which allows a child to express their story, not necessarily just through a narration or a conversation, but through an activity which actually meets their interests. So they might build something, they may drama out their thoughts, they may uh, create a a kind of image of something that they want to consider. Um, But also I think, and we've just heard this from um, the researchers, is around this notion of doing things together about having this opportunity to share their lives and as we talk about in life story work the concept of sharing our stories helps us to share our lives that young people creatively creatively rather can actually do that through a medium which is more uh, familiar or more accessible for them and so I think it's taking away from that uh, one-to-one conversation that cognitive stuff to something much more um, available to our young people. Richard, just while we're on, we've got we've got a, a very um, particular question that's come through from one of our um, participants today, and they were wondering about they the talk about there being no right time for a child to start this process, but they're curious to know if it would be appropriate when a young person has a placement move pending. Is it appropriate to start this when they're when they're on that journey? Okay, so I think if we're talking about creative all about me work or all about me work I think we should leave it at that point for today uh, then I'm I'm very much in favor of, of doing these pieces of work every six months on a cyclical context so they build their story as they journey through their care experience um, but there are often times where movement has to take place which might be you know as an emergency or it might be planned and I think the nature of the the movement will depend on the appropriateness of the actual Uh, all about me session if we are going to look at creativity over six sessions six different titles if you like uh, it might well be that some of that work will help in that um, movement so if I can give you one brief example uh, if you have a young person who has told their story in a placement uh, they have expressed what their interests are what they struggle with what they understand about their journey and then they find themselves into a new placement Hopefully with the All About Me book, they won't have to go through all that story again. They have their passport. And so when it comes to that new carer or that new environment, they know what the child enjoys. They know what the child uh, understands. They understand a little bit about that child's preferences and that child's challenges. And so it should ease that placement move rather than complicate it. So I think you just have to look at the reason for the move. Um, But if it's progressive, if it's uh, supportive, then All About Me's can be very, very useful. Our local authority colleagues, um, and I don't know who would like to answer this, Pam or Joanne, um, there's two questions that I'm merging here, and it's about the funding. How can we pay for for this um, for this programme? And, uh, and as a sub-question to that, um, one of our participants has asked, are the regional adoption agencies able to access Creative Life Story work through the Adoption Support Fund? Who would like to tackle that, Pam or Joanne? 
I, I can attempt to answer. I don't know. Thank you, Joanne. <laughs> no. um, in terms of the adoption support fund, um, I don't believe um, this is linked particularly in terms of this program to um, the therapy that's available through the adoption support fund. I may have that wrong, but I, I don't believe it is linked at this moment. Um, in terms of funding, um, I, I think I've already mentioned in the breakout room and at the beginning um, in the podcast, the funding that we had um, from What Works was absolutely invaluable to this. I'm not sure we would, we would have been able to get off the ground as well as we have if we didn't have that funding. However, saying that, um, Blue Cabin have been very, very proactive in sourcing additional um, funding streams from various different areas. And um, we have actually um, agreed, it's probably still news to Jenny at the moment, but we've just agreed internally that we have been able to match the funding available um yes love heart thank you jenny um to enable us to continue working with blue cabin and richard um for the next 12 months um and again that's thanks to um thank you chloe and again that's that's thanks to to jenny and the team being able to identify 50 percent of the funding that's required which is which is a big amount um so we're really pleased that we've been able to, to identify the other 50%, which in the big scheme of things, and if you think about how much a residential placement for one child costs per week, it's not a huge amount of money at all. But in the big scheme of things, when we're pressured with budgets, it's a chunk of money, but it's definitely worth being creative about in terms of trying to identify sources of funding, which, which we've managed to do. So, yeah. I don't know um, if that answers the question. Absolutely answers my question. Um, and is Pam here? I wondered if you wanted to add anything different to that, Pam? Um, I am here. Um, I, I don't think I can add anything different. We are um, we are we are looking at the next phase for us. So that includes kind of any funding that we may be able to make available, so that we can continue with the creative life story work um i think that we're very much wanting to um set out our vision where we're trying to get to how far have we got along there because we have done quite a lot of work um but i would imagine any funding will just come out of children's services budget it's it we usually just ask anthony actually <laughs> Ask Anthony. Very yeah. good. Name him in this session. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Pam. Um, and uh, I have a question here that I'm going to um, uh, ask our artists to comment on. And one of the participants has asked, what difference has this made to the children, young people and carers that you've had in your sessions? So who would like to tackle that first? Lizette, would you like to go first? Or? Yeah, I'll go and I'll pass to you. I think the difference has been, I can give you one beautiful example, a young person who came incredibly scared and for the entire first session said nothing whatsoever and refused to be on camera. And the amazing thing was, was that we'd let them refuse to be on camera and they weren't used to that. They weren't used to not being forced to do something. And by the end of that first session, through giggling and being together and making little things, there was this, they chose, and that was the moment that was magic for me, they chose to turn the camera around and they chose to be in that session. And it's very hard as the artist in there who's trying to hold it all together when you've got goosebumps all over the place and you're trying not to cry to, <laughs> to hold that space for someone. Um, and I think that's where it's been, it's been magic. It's been those moments of conversation that have happened around the art without them realizing that the art's the squiffy, squishy way to get into those beautiful and magnificent conversations. And in those conversations where people have been able to say, we've never spoken about this before, or I didn't know that about you, or, oh, let's go and do that after this session. We'll pack it up for now, but we'll do it later. Those have been the magic moments for me. And Michelle, our other associate artist on the panel today, what would you like to add to that? I think the word confidence was used earlier in terms of delivery. 
Um, but I think that confidence emerges in the in the children and young people. And that that comes from lots of things. I think one of the things is the regularity of meeting. So initially we're new, it's all new, so that can be scary, like Lizette's mentioned. But actually, over the course of the six weeks, you can see the confidence build in terms of not just the making, but in terms of the, the chatting on, the relationships. And um, I mean, we've, all, we've got lots and lots of examples. I've been lucky to be involved since the beginning, so just finished the eighth block the eighth round if you like and they're all different um but there was one particular group where it was like you were ducking and weaving every week online it was just a kind of shift in sands and then initially there was one young person that maybe was struggling with that but uh, over the course of the the six weeks at the end they were actually leaning into the, the screen and asking questions of another young person. So you could see the barriers dropping. And that comes from the chatting on, the regularity. It comes from the lovely art that we can do. And it comes from that support um, from the um, pastoral support worker and the behind the scenes. So there's lots going on, but I think confidence building has got to be in there for the young people, children and young people. And it's wonderful to witness. Absolutely. Um, and just Lisette and um, Michelle, while you're on, a very particular question about the age range of children and young people and um, what that was. And is it best with any particular age range? It, what's been your experience about, because I know you, you can talk to that between you. I think any. I mean, I, initially I put myself down for, to work with the younger ones. And maybe that was my confidence building, needing to say, well, actually, what I've de designed could work with older young people. And um, I mean, no kidding, I've, pro I've worked with, with uh, children between five and 16 now. So, and, and, and it, it works because you, 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 you duck and weave to help make it work. And I think Elena pointed out something really beautiful in her breakout. Um, is that part of our job is listening and, and being prepared to develop what we do in response to what the young children or young people say. And I know Elena has mentioned that already, and I'm sure Lizette's, I've had that, and I've had a kind of, whoa, you go with the flow a bit and duck and weave, but it, it, it's possible across the board. You just yeah. kind of tweak what you do and how you go in, but it's... Older, older young people, older young people, older children and young people love it because they like to play and give a chance to play. Anyway, yeah. Is that? Yeah, yeah, completely agree. So we've divided um, all of us as artists. It's in three different year groups. So the really littlies, the ones in the middle and the older ones. And we as artists decide where we can pitch those sessions. Um, and I know that at the beginning, I definitely only wanted to work with older ones because I felt that that's maybe where um, the writing skills kind of lay more or maybe I was scared, like Michelle said. But then it's that realising that um, we plan to the nth degree. Um, thanks to Michelle, I always make sure in my box there is some plasticine because that is the go-to anyone can work with and seem to love working with plasticine. Um, but because we've planned so well, it means that we can tailor it beautifully to whoever's in the session. And um, numbers have no meaning. Um, lots of the older people, allegedly, that we work with um, um, may be playing or making at a younger age. So it's all about just adapting to the people that are there. And that's where um, our skills as artists come in, that we play and make and we find out what we need and then we tailor it for the people in the room individually. Somebody else in chat uh, agreeing with you completely and also commenting on the growing confidence of um, adults in the room as well. One of your fellow artists, Ruth, commenting on that. Thank you. Um, I would like to pick up on one of the questions that was put in the chat. And this is a question um, for Chloe or Sarah. Uh, or maybe for, actually for Sarah from Ipsos. And the question is, did children with acute behaviour challenges and 
PMLDs, you might need to say what that is, take part in the All About Me sessions and were excluded from the outcomes measures or weren't they included at all and why? Are you able to make a comment on that, Sarah? Idea was that that was going to be the uh, logic for recruitment, so the eligibility criteria for the programme itself. And as evaluators, we're following that logic and looking at the children who um, who attend, but also because of this kind of design of evaluation with the, the two groups, the intervention group and the control group, so the people who are offered and the ones who are not offered uh, this referral, uh, we, we look at all the outcome measures for all the children that get through that first filter. So they get, get fall into that pool of being eligible, potentially eligible. So not children who are in the secure state. They're outside of our scope and, and, and view. So they might nonetheless benefit potentially from the fact that you've got a better trained workforce that knows more about all about life story work. Um, but from the point of view of evaluating the All About Me sessions, no, that's out of scope for those children, a small group. Jenny, I wondered with your blue cabin hat on whether you'd like to say anything about that question yeah sure and um, so if we if we think about the creative life story work program uh, triangle we've got all about me more about me and therapeutic life story work and as Sarah and Chloe were mentioning for the purposes of the evaluation and the randomized control trial we focused in on the all about me creative experiences and um, in order for us to uh ensure that that intervention was appropriate for the children and young people who were offered it we worked with Richard and the local authorities to think about whether a child or young person was ready for an all about me or actually whether it was more appropriate at that time for tier two, more about me or tier three, therapeutic life story work. If tier two and tier three, because of um, where the child was in, at in the world and because of their past experience, if tiers two and tiers three were most appropriate for them, they weren't taking part in the randomized control trial. And that was because um, it was a therapeutic intervention that they needed, facilitated by a trained therapeutic life story worker. For any child that um, in conversation with their social worker and their carer, they were deemed to be ready for All About Me, they were put forward and they either had the offer or they didn't. So for those who were in, for example, the offer group, there's been a range of um, abilities, a range of needs, and um, the artists are really skilled at working with a range of children and young people and drawing upon their strengths and, and differentiating their sessions and making sure they're accessible. The model as it is, isn't necessarily ready for those with profound needs. It's not to say that it wouldn't be in the future. Um, uh, but right now, uh, it certainly is accessible for children for a range of needs. But for those with profound and multiple learning needs, we need to do more work to make sure it's absolutely right for them and appropriate and can be held really safely. I'm going to come to my last question now, um, and I'm going to ask the same question to each of our panellists today. I'll read you the question first. Um, I thought we could end with a smile. So the question was, what has brought a smile or made you chuckle during the development and facilitation of the creative life story work sessions? Um, and as our artists were talking about some of the smiles that they had in their sessions, I'm going to start with our artists first and then I'm going to ask each of the panellists. So, uh, Michelle, what's made you smile or chuckle during the development of your creative life story work sessions? Oh, good question. And I'm right on the spot. I haven't got time to think. Um, one of the things in my last session and talking about having to develop ideas, I had a, a, young, a, a young person that had particular needs so um, the lovely Nick, another of the artists, um, I pinched one of her ideas and he, because this young lad liked to throw things, we started to make paper aeroplanes. So that was a really joyous thing that he could do, he could achieve, and we had such a hoot, just chucking, chucking bits of paper at the end of the session. So thank you, Nick. I nicked your idea, but it it worked. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Lizette, one sentence. What made you smile or chuckle during your sessions? One of the activities we do is to do don't look down portraits where you draw the picture of somebody else and you're not allowed to, to take your pen off the page or to look down while doing it. I have got the most amazing screenshots of my face 
in most bizarre formations <laughs> and I will treasure those forever. Thank you. Uh, Richard, what's made you smile or chuckle? But for me, not involved in the sessions, um, but involved with the artists. It's really um, when we were sitting in a restaurant talking about this project we were all going to go on and just hearing today just the impact it's had on the artist that's enough to keep me going it's just nice to see you all having so much fun yourselves thank you richard and pam what's made you smile or chuckle as someone who's been been involved right from the very very beginning well the day i got my box of goodies <laughs> was an amazing day and it, i was ex- as excited as any child opening that box and um, I worked with Michelle and we did a fun thing where we all had to go off and find a glove and a hat and a scarf. And we took a lovely screenshot and that that was a lovely picture for me, something that I definitely treasure. And the final word, Joanne, what's made you smile or chuckle as somebody else who's been involved? Pam has just stolen my thunder slightly we're Uh, happy to share (laughs) (laughs) so obviously I I haven't been involved in the actual session so um but what came to mind when you said um when you've asked that question was when my box um, was picked up and I took it home and it was a prototype and we had a session with some of the leads across the local authorities and I think I can't remember which artist um, we did it with but we actually spent about an hour hour and a half just going through these absolutely gorgeous little boxes and experiencing what a child is going to experience um, and it was just absolutely lovely and and we did giggle because we, we were putting on silly voices and things like that so it was just lovely to, to just to have some sense of what a child was going to be experiencing so it was lovely. Thank you to our panellists today for uh, asking, uh, answering the questions that we've gathered from participants. We realise that not all questions have been answered, but don't worry. We, none of your questions have been lost. They've all been gathered up. And after the event, you'll be sent a link to um, something called a Padlet, where all of your questions will be answered uh, by the person that you wanted to pose that question to. So I'd like to thank my panellists today. Um, If you want to find out more about other podcasts that we've made in this series, please go to wearebluecabin.com forward slash podcast. Uh, We'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, You can record and send us a message to the show via the website. If you're one of the 1,500 people who were already taking part in our creative life story work learning program um, you can get in touch through the thinkific learning platform Um, if you'd like to listen to future episodes of our podcasts subscribe to wherever it is you usually get your podcasts and if you're using apple podcasts please leave us a review as it really helps others to find the show so i'd like to say thank you to our panelists thank you to our learning event participants for taking part in this live podcast Um, and we'll be releasing this in the next couple of weeks for you to listen back to.